Hi, I'm Jamie Zachariah with the Ocean Exploration Trust. At OET, we're super excited to explore the deep sea alongside our partners and collaborators within the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Together, we're looking at so many different aspects of ocean science, and one of those is ocean biodiversity. And a great way to study that is by collecting eDNA, or environmental DNA. Last year on our expeditions, we collected eDNA while exploring in and around the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa. This year we will continue our eDNA collection from EV Nautilus as we explore the waters around the Mariana Islands. And all of this is a wonderful first step, but what comes next? To learn more about the process, we visited some colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. It's so nice to see Hi, you again. Hi, you too. Hi, Jamie. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having us here at yeah. Woods Hole. I'm Annette Govindarajan. I'm a biologist here at Hui. You know, we sailed together on the Nautilus on NA-165, exploring American Samoan waters and the Vailulu Seamount. And I'm really excited to see how you've taken some of those samples you collected and what kind of research you've been doing on them here at the lab. Yeah, that's true because a lot of our work comes after the cruise. Right. There's a lot of emphasis on preparing for the cruise and the technology that we use, but what really should be appreciated is that so much goes on after the cruise. Awesome, you yeah. wanna show us around? Yeah, sure, absolutely, come on in. This is our main lab. Again, we do molecular approaches here to studying biodiversity in the ocean. So we've got one uh, molecular lab area over here where we work with specimens. And then I can take you upstairs where we have an eDNA lab, environmental DNA. eDNA is especially uh, sensitive to contamination. So we keep that work separate from our rest of our work. Again, this is our staging area and I pulled out um, our sampling technologies that we have here. Um, this is the more conventional approach of filtering water. This is a peristaltic pump. Sort of the typical way is where the water is collected in bottles called Niskin bottles. We bring those back up to the surface and then we filter the water on board the ship. It's basically manually pumped. It takes a lot longer and can get confusing when you've got a lot of samples. This is our um, high-tech approach that we developed. This is the Oceanic Hui multi-sampler. It takes 16 samples. You can see there's eight slots on each side. Each slot has its own pump. And right here, uh, you see this is actually one of our filter capsules, twist and lock mechanism that fits into the slot. So if you've seen Mezabot, you notice that underneath there's a payload area at the bottom. Mm. That's where we integrate the samplers. We also can put this on other platforms. So we've put yeah. it on the ROV Hercules and we collected a lot of samples with that approach. So this is actually um, a lot more efficient. So we can get large volume samples. And what we have found in the deep ocean is that once you start getting below like 150, 200 meters, uh, the eDNA signal gets more and more dilute. And so getting large volumes of water helps us to better detect greater diversity of, of animals that are down there. Let's go back to basics for a quick second. Sure. Environmental DNA. Sure. For someone who's never heard the term environmental DNA, or as it's also called, eDNA, what right. is it? So e in, in the broadest sense, environmental DNA or eDNA refers to any eDNA in the environment. For microbes, uh, we might be looking at single-celled organisms and that's, you know, the organism. For animals, though, we're looking at traces that these animals leave behind, like uh, cells that they shed, fecal pellets, gametes, little tissue fragments, right? It could be anything, and it's, it's, it's probably a mixture of, of different things. But what we can do is sample the water by filtering it. That material gets collected onto the filter. So we have these little particles. You can contain these trace genetic signals, right? And then we take those filters and we can extract the DNA from those filters. It's really like a forensic style approach, like for ocean forensics is a way to think about it. So this allows us to see things that we could never actually see Absolutely. So when people, uh, whether it's my lab, other people's labs have done studies where we've looked at biodiversity that we can detect with eDNA versus conventional nets, we find that both approaches can detect many of the same kinds of animals, but that each approach also detects others that um, the other approach misses. So by adding this to our toolkit, okay, we are increasing our knowledge of biodiversity and better understanding the full picture of what's out there. 
This was deployed on a variety of different vehicles. Right. You can also sample in different depths and different strategies and take advantage of different types of co-collected sensor data. Mezabot is particularly suited for sampling in the midwater. So what we would do, our strategy would to be do vertical transects, uh, daytime and nighttime. We can look at the difference uh, between daytime and nighttime distributions of animals and infer how animals migrate according to daytime or nighttime cycles. And then we put it on Hercules. Hercules, we took a totally different type of strategy where we sampled um, near the bottom. And so while Hercules is sort of moving up the bottom, okay, along the track the, up the seamounts, we were continuously filtering water with these as well. So we were able to get samples that represent near bottom distributions of animals. And when you were on Nautilus, you were in the control van as we we're exploring the bottom of the ocean and you were instructing the pilots when to take samples. Big abundance of authentic animals here. Yep. Very cool. Which would be a great DNA sample and it. It will be really interesting for sure. See what we get. We have the added benefit when we use Hercules, we can see the, this video in, in real time and make decisions as to when and where to sample. Sometimes we would come upon an area that was especially, seemed especially interesting or unique or had a lot of life that we could see and say, okay, we want to sample there as well. At the same time, we also had the ability with Hercules to take physical specimens, right? And that's really, really important because not only, it's, it's another way of assessing biodiversity, but it also informs our eDNA results. So what you can do and, and what you need to do for eDNA is when you get your DNA sequences, you have to be able to know what they are, right. right? And so you compare those to reference sequences that come from specimens that someone else has already identified. So for the past few years, as we know, the OECI technology collaboration cruises have been essential in figuring out how we can take all of this amazing technology and work together to maximize the amount of ship time that we have in an area. So you'll have something like Sentry mapping the area, and then using those maps, we'll decide where we're going to bring Hercules. Right. And on Hercules, we put the sampler, and we can get these samplers, so we can come back later and dive with Mesobot, and then sample the same area, but higher up in the water column. Right, the ocean's a very big space, and we may want to target our sampling, and, and being able to, to do that with this novel adaptive sampling approach while still collecting data really covers a lot of ground. Well, what have we learned so far? What can so, you share? So, yeah, so everything we're doing now has built on what we've done in the past. We learned, for example, that eDNA is dilute in the deep ocean. So mm -hmm. our t traditional method of using the Niskin bottles wasn't telling us as much as we could learn, right? So we developed these autonomous samplers that can filter large volumes of water in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, that we then learned how to work with Mizabot to develop a deployment strategies to study dial over vertical migration. And we learned that we can actually detect signals from that migration with eDNA. So you can look at like the broad spectrum of life from an uh, individual sample. So I'm really excited to see the eDNA lab. I want to see where the magic happens. Sure, absolutely. Let's go. We can do that upstairs uh, to keep that work separate with what we do down here to avoid any kind of uh, contamination processes. So we uh, keep that lab very clean and dedicate it to uh, eDNA work specifically. I can imagine contamination is a big risk when you're working with such delicate particles. Here we are. Uh, this is our eDNA lab. Why don't you come on in? So we've got a little, a um, few different workspaces here. This is a UV hood, ultraviolet light, where we can turn on and we can put equipment down here to, to sterilize, to keep clean. It's also a, an area where we can work in a clean space. And this is where my research assistant takes out the filters for the extractions. So come on into the main lab. Oh, this is Kaya, my research assistant. Hi, I'm Kaya. I'm a research assistant for uh, Dr. Annette Garvandarajan, and I do a lot of the work on extracting our eDNA samples. Can you show me how you extract an eDNA sample? I would be happy to. So we keep everything super sterile, and for this part we work in the PCR hood to keep everything extra clean, so it's only the clean filtered air that's interacting with the filters in here. We use a big pipe cutter to get through. These filters were not designed to have the filter taken out and used for this. 
I want to cut it without letting this blade touch the actual filter, even though I've cleaned it just to be extra safe. And now we've got our filter. I will take the filter out of the capsule and then slice it up into little pieces so that uh, we can maximize the amount of surface area that's exposed to the different buffers that we'll use to extract the DNA. So on our filters, we have three different layers. There's the first outer layer and then a middle paper layer and then this final inner layer we don't use. There's not any significant DNA that gets caught on it. And then we tend to separate and extract DNA from both of these two remaining layers separately. And I know Annette was talking about how dilution happens in the deeper sea. How does that impact how much work you have to do here? That's a great question. Um, the uh, DNA that I extract, once we've got that extracted liquid, it can vary how much DNA is actually on the filter. So sometimes we'll have higher concentration and that usually is what comes from the samples that happen for higher in the water column. And then the samples that are in the very deep ocean, we often have very little DNA. We'll get maybe less than one nanogram per microliter of concentrated DNA in the final uh, purified product that we have. So in here, I will add uh, some buffers. So I'm pipetting a little bit of our first lysis buffer, and this will help break down all of the cells in the filter. What does a pipette do? Pipette allows us to uh, pick up a very precise amount of liquid. So here I've got it set to exactly 900 microliters, which is a little less than one milliliter. So we took the filter paper out of the filters that we collected the seawater from, and we cut it into little pieces. We put them in these vials, we added the buffer, and what's next before we can really extract the DNA? Now I vortex to get it all mixed up and expose all of the filter to our buffer, and then they'll go sit in the incubator for the next three hours, and I'll keep coming back to vortex them uh, every so often. And then we'll go through, add some more stuff, which will help us to pr sort of wash out all of the extra stuff. So I'll take our uh, samples here, and then I will pass them through these uh, spin columns. So they've got a special membrane at the bottom. The DNA will stick to the membrane and everything else will pass through and we can keep just the DNA that we're interested in without uh, other things or things which might inhibit the PCR later. And then we'll take them over here into the centrifuge and uh, it spins them super, super fast. And that centripetal force will force the liquid uh, past the membrane that I was talking about. So how long was the spin for? So it spins for just a minute, um, but it gets up to 13,000 rotations per minute. This is not an easy process. It's not like you take the filter and you just put it under a microscope and look at it. It's true, yes. It takes quite a while, so it's not fast data, but definitely worthwhile. Is there any big piece of information we're missing? No, but I'd like to show you how we put it all together from the sea to the lab. This is what we're after, the data. So this is just an example here of some eDNA analyses from our Nautilus NA-155 cruise. And what we're looking at in this figure are the relative abundance of eDNA sequences at different depths of fishes. This was conducted using the same process that you're seeing here, that you've seen here today in my lab where we've extracted the DNA, we've sequenced what's called the 12S DNA barcode marker, and that's useful for telling us information about fishes. And so what, what can we learn? Well, we see all kinds of fish species, a uh, lot highest diversity in the, between 100 and 600 meters, and that's exciting. It tells us that this upper mesopelagic and lower sunlit zone are, are really where we're seeing the greatest fish diversity, and that's really important for understanding our fisheries resources. So all of this really is just underscoring how little has been discovered in our global ocean. With the approaches that we've been developing, combining technology and, and the biology, we're really opening up a wealth of new data and, and new insights to the deep sea. Thank you so much for showing us around your lab, for explaining all this wonderful science that you do and how 
technology collaboration is integral for it. And it's been such a good time here today. Thanks, I'm so glad you came. It's really exciting and uh, it's, it's incredible to have the opportunity to do this work.